Hello, everyone. Uh, today is Wednesday. I keep, every time I introduce these Mom at Homes, I have to take a moment and remember exactly what day of the week it is. I know that Mom at Home is timeless and it will continue on well after uh, Wednesday is over, but for me, I like to put a timestamp on it because it helps me know where we are in the week and what's coming up. Uh, I hope everyone is having a good Wednesday today, uh, and I am uh, very excited, very excited for today's host and subject. Uh, Michael Lehman Boddicker has, has, I mean, his career, his repertoire, everything he's done is just, it basically was my childhood, all the music he has played on and all the memories that that has created. He has been a part of whether I knew it whether he knew it or not so for me this is I mean it's it's fun to hear all these stories about things you never knew you never knew but also Michael Lehman Boddicker is is done work with the museum before and is just a superb person to work with and a uh, scholar very knowledgeable and so fun to talk with and so Today, we are welcoming him. He's going to be talking about his career, about synthesizers, about working with synthesizers, and so much more. And uh, we actually have our, our very own Dr. Jonathan Piper, who will be guiding that conversation. And so th we're just going to have a great day today. Uh, in, uh, if you're joining us live, please uh, feel free, post your questions, your comments, and I will be taking care of reading those and passing them along as much as I can. Uh, other than that, Dr. Piper and Mr. Lehman Boddicker, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Right. I think so. All right. Well, let yeah. me go ahead and hand it over to you, gentlemen. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Michael, so much for being here. Um, as, as BJ mentioned, I mean, the career is, is just, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, you know, looking at the, the list of credits, it's almost faster to talk about whose albums you didn't play on. Um, than whose you did, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but I mean, you know, Grammy Award winner, Doctor of Music, um, you know, the, the accomplishments are just incredible. And, um, you know, and, and beyond that, you are, you are just a heck of a lot of fun to talk to. I feel like when I call you with what I think is going to be a quick question, you know, I look down at my watch and suddenly it's an hour later. Um, <laughs> we we so, have a tendency to do that. Yeah. 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 So thank you for being here. Thank you for, for giving us some of your time. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, I, I was thinking while BJ was introducing us that, uh, uh, you know, it was, it's the first volley of, Boy, when I was little, I used to listen to the music you played on, you know, and 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 twist that knife. But that was the goal, uh, you know. I'm the goal sorry. Uh, every day. I had that card by the side of my bed that said I wanted to be one of the best synthesizer players in the world. And I woke up and I went to sleep with that card. That you know, there were other things on the list as well, but that was the the head thing on the list. And and the goal was to play on music that millions of people heard. And that music, uh, music that millions of people enjoyed, and, and it, that it enriched their lives, and that's that's I think one of the things that inspires me the most about being involved in music. Period is the benefit that it brings to anybody who really, you know, uh, pours themselves into it or just has it brush up against them. Uh, and music benefits everything from math. You know, and I strongly believe this, and I've uh, applied it uh, to all four of my children, who are all brilliant in math, and and that that music connects the left and the right uh, right brain, and uh, it helps kids in their studies. It helps their thinking. the The fact that uh, music education has uh, suffered, you know, in school. We used to have a, a person who came by a couple times a week into our classroom. And when I was in sixth grade, we started playing musical instruments, uh, you know, in, in, in school. And uh, besides growing up in a household that was filled, I, 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 I know that, that I've talked to you guys, uh, Jonathan and BJ, about this, but the, the audience might not know that my parents with the Boddicker School of Music up here, when I grew up, I grew up, uh, we had four houses in a row on First Avenue. Our backyard was adjacent to the police uh, police station and a little bit farther up the Board of Education. But we had four houses in a row that were filled with the music store. 
Wow. That's and cool. the, you know, Shales was on the corner. The next house over was where all the band instruments and the guitars and the amplifiers were housed for sale. And the next house over that we actually lived in, we had seven unacoustically isolated uh, studios in the basement that operated from 3.30 in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday, and on Saturdays from 8.30 in the morning till 5.30, 6 o'clock. And we had then a, our backyard, we lost our backyard because it became a band room. We had a cinder block <laughs> building that was 10 feet tall, that was about 25 feet wide and about 40 feet long. And we had band practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, one or two bands of you know 20 20 guitar players say to 40 drummers or a 40 accordion players one or two of those bands every night and that was my life growing up you know uh, uh people ask me how, how did i get into the music business and and i tell them about my nam story which is that i'm 67 years old and i've been to 68 years of NAM shows because my mom carried me in the womb on, on the uh, NAM floor. And, and one of the reasons I enjoy being uh, so much a part of Museum of Making Music and the people who are at NAM, you guys, uh, Joe Lamont, Bill, everybody. Uh, I, I love NAM shows, such a big part of my life. And it's been a big part of my musical career, watching what went on at NAM shows, you know, mm. I, uh, watching Every year, Joe Morello play with Dave Brubeck for five years in a row, uh, watching the Buckinghams when they had a number one record in Mercy, Mercy, Mercy play live on stage. From the, I was at the side of the stage watching Phil Upchurch and Don Lewis play every year. I used to sit at his feet at the organ and watch it when I was just a little kid. And um, and he's not that much older than I am, but he's, you know, he was 10 years older than I was and, and he was 21 and I was 11 and I'd, I'd sit and watch him play. And, 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 you know, it, it's just uh, been a phenomenal part of my life and I love it. And I can't wait to see how Nam adjusts to what's going to happen in the next year and a half. You know, that that's going to be. Uh, it's there are two parts to that. Number one, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. But number two is NAM is a leader. And, and I must say that, that in navigating this experience, one of the things that I did was I started joining in the NAM programs. And I learned as a business owner and as a person who's now, you know, essentially unemployed, uh, I get to, uh, and who had employees who didn't have any work, you know? So we, I learned through the NAM uh, uh, organization and through the uh, presentations that you did on the COVID and uh, unemployment insurance and on navigating the SBA uh, EIDL loans and all that stuff. I, I learned all that and any forward motion I've had has been because I attended those NAM seminars. And uh, you're just, you guys, you guys, I'll give you two all the credit for NAM. You guys, it's just <laughs> such yeah. a great, it's such we'll a great part of, of, of my life, such a big part of my life. And, and uh, I, I display my yearly placards. I, I actually buy two memberships into NAM uh, every year. And I, uh, I'm, and I have uh, since I, since I could, you know, so it's uh, probably, 45, almost 50 years now that I've been uh, my own membership in NAM. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, lo I love the organization. Yeah, I love and I, a, a little context too, because not all of our viewers will be familiar with, with what NAM is and what they do. NAM is actually, it's a, uh, they're the parent organization that we're, the Museum of Making Music is under the NAM Foundation. And NAM is a global trade association over 100 years old. And they represent anybody who makes instruments, anybody who sells instruments. And they provide um, this massive, massive trade show every year in January at the Anaheim Convention Center. With NAM's history, I mean, they've weathered so many storms. They've weathered the Great Depression. They've weathered wars. They've we weathered many what did we call them, Jonathan? Uh, Chrysotunities. Chrysotunities. So NAM is, is oh, a, is a very, very well versed on how to 
weather the weather the storm and yeah they're weathering they're doing the same now making decisions that will you know guide guide the the show and all the people that they serve and the industry that they serve and so as being part of the museum we are within that umbrella because we showcase we show the history of all that there at the museum of making music those who um, make instruments those who sell instruments how those instruments are used which is where Mr. Lehman Boddicker comes into play, you know, he takes these innovations, these wonderful instruments that somebody has made that may end up at a retail store somewhere or at somebody's um, you know, rental company, maybe. And then or just, in, or just at the NAM show or just I at mean, the a, NAM lot show. Of, a lot of things. Exactly. I, I was going I was going through uh, when I was clearing a warehouse recently and I have an emulator SP 12 zero 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 one. I, I had emulator, uh, the emulator one, zero, 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 one. I had, uh, there, were, there were about three things in that warehouse that had the serial number zero, 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 one, which means that I went to the NAMM show, I saw them and I bought them. You know, again, it, uh, just for people to understand, you don't just walk in and buy things. I came from a, a family that had a music store. In fact, they had, uh, four, not just the four buildings that I had, but they had uh, four different locations uh, in, in Iowa. And then any any night of the week, there were 37 uh, satellite studios, Yeah, uh, you know, out in small towns and stuff. And, and they'd load up the seven station wagons that were parked out back of our house <laughs> and put, put the teachers in them and send them out to Vinton and Tipton and whatever. And they'd give music lessons all night. Uh, so, so I, it, I didn't want to give you the impression that uh, NAM is retail, but we did some pretty interesting this last uh, month, Jonathan. We, we're showing, uh, you have now one of my Hammond Nova chords. Yes, which we're, which... we're very excited about for our upcoming renovation. Um, the, the first, at least commercially available, polyphonic synthesizer uh, made by the <laughs> Hammond Organ Company in 1939 of all times. Um, really, really amazing technology, but of course it's all done through vacuum tubes. Um, but before we get, before we get too far into the, the Hammond Nova Chord. Oh, I can't wait to hear okay. about the Hammond okay, Nova because Chord. He, I really can't. I mean, the people need to know that that weighs 675 pounds and, and what one the, and a half, one and a half times the size of a B3. And what is the, the total count of vacuum tubes in that thing? Oh, I, I, I have no idea, but it, it it's. <laughs> It's bordering. It's got to be a thousand, close to a thousand. <laughs> yeah. So, so for anybody who's not familiar, which I imagine is most of our viewers with the, the Hammond Nova Chord, uh, it's a it's a polyphonic synthesizer with seventy two voices of polyphony, featuring six oscillators, one for each octave, and then a bunch of step down voltage dividers, um, and then it has like it has filters, it has LFOs for tremolo functions. Um, All individual on each voice so that yeah. when it plays, it sounds very thick like an orchestra because not all the vibrato is moving together. Hmm. Not all the filters are exactly the same. Yeah, I think, it, I think it has recordings. five LFO units um, and they're all going at slightly different rates. Specifically, yeah, to, to fill it out because when you start with one with when you start with one oscillator which goes to six, which then divides down into six octaves, you get a lot of synchronicity and in phaseness. And and when you do a bunch of polyphony with that, it can sound very thin or or open. And so when you have those five vibrato units going at the same time at slightly different speeds, it's lush and it's full and it's rich. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, one of our one of our viewers aptly named Synth Chaser for uh, for the ch chat uh, says the electric bill is high when you play it a lot. So I can I can imagine that's a pretty astute <laughs> observation. Yeah, it does not run on on battery power. That's sure. a consideration. That's why I got rid of my SSL. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, big my big console. I used to have a, a forty sixty four. And besides the maintenance bills, having to let, let the electricity run uh, 24 hours a day, SSL has come on and they have now Energy Star products as well. But, you know, that used to not be such a consideration. Now it is, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. how much electricity we burn mm -hmm. and, and whether or not we can actually take our instrument, the synthesizer, to the beach with us. And yes, you can, because most of it can be right here. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. We just kind of amazing. Plug in your X key or 
get your teenage engineering device uh, or, 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 and uh, you can, you can take it to the beach, a uh, set of headphones. You can write music at the beach all day. It's great. Yeah. Couldn't do that with my synth rig. So, so yeah, your synth rig, I, I kind of want to talk about your synth rig. And uh, I was trying with that zero, 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 one thing. I was trying to do a really slick segue um, into talking about your first synth. So with the family that you had, with the background you had, the upbringing you have, it's almost implausible. It's unimaginable that you wouldn't have ended up in music somehow. But you didn't start on, on the synthesizer. How did you go? I mean, my understanding is you played the trumpet and your mom yeah, played, I played accordion. I played accordion from a very early age. You know, one of the okay. things I was thinking about is that it gave me extra time with my mom. You know, mm -hmm. who worked, she, they, they, they both, you know, the, the music store opened at 9 a.m. and it closed at 10 o'clock at night. And, wow. and, you know, I came home from school and she was teaching from 3.30 till 10 o'clock. So, you know, I, uh, it gave me, you know, at least an extra half hour a week that I got to see my mom. And uh, so I played accordion and then I played piano. I took some organ lessons. I took orchestration lessons. But when I was about eight nine the the band teacher you know started me on trumpet which is weird because i i have an angel's bow which is not a great trumpet lip and uh then uh i i started playing well when i saw i started playing guitar but then when i saw the beatles mm -hmm. i saw the beatles uh. and, and and i'll tell you what kind of family i grew up in and we're sitting there on sunday night as a family watching uh the, the Ed Sullivan show and the Beatles come on and I go to the mirror that's on top of the organ that's in our living room and I comb my hair down onto my bank <laughs> and my dad slapped me. Oh no. He slapped me right there and because it scared him. It scared him that I would consider being part of what he thought of musicians as, as the people who weren't involved in music education were not you know, uh, of the highest caliber that he had had experiences with, you know, mm. and, and uh, so he, it scared him a lot, but that cemented in my mind uh, that that's what I wanted to do. And it wasn't about that girls were screaming. I know I still have a lot of friends who go, Oh no, it was about the chicks. I, I, I got into it for the chicks. Uh, it wasn't about the money. What I liked was I saw four guys on stage, shoulder to shoulder, making music and having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and, and I loved that. And I still, to this day, it, it, you know, try, they're trying to push us all into where we operate in a box by ourselves. You know, that you do, you play all the instruments yourself. You, you do it all on a computer and, and you don't have other people to bounce ideas off of. And, and, that's not the music industry that really excites me. The music industry that excites me is uh, orchestral playing, band playing. Uh, one of the reasons I liked being in the studio so much was the, the smallest core that we had was an assistant engineer, an engineer, a producer, usually an arranger and a studio musician or two at the same time in the room. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and everybody's focusing and concentrating and you're all trading ideas and, and, you know, exciting each other's yeah. uh, intellect. It, it was great. And I, and I love that. I love that part of the music industry. And then, you know, I was blessed to be in a time when there were 105 and even 115 piece studio orchestras mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, you know, that's the studio orchestra that doesn't count. You know, the people that are working on the stage doesn't count the engineer, the assistant engineer, the orchestrator, the copyist, the librarian, you know, all of that. You know, it, it was a it was at the contractor big operation and and it was it was really nice and different because everything was so expensive that it, it people really were demanding. And usually in that day, they still were on schedules where the you know the composers didn't get to sleep really in tv you know i saw oliver nelson i saw nelson riddle i saw all these guys that were you know 65 70 years old at that time and they weren't sleeping for three days at a time they would just stay up and write music to make the deadline and they get on the podium and you know they they'd be a little frazzled. And, <laughs> and if anything didn't go exactly right, you know, you might have an angry outburst, not, not mentioning those people 
personally. They they didn't. The, Nelson Nelson was really sweet, uh, and Nelson Riddle and Oliver Nelson. But the you know to uh, so certain people would get pretty surly when they'd been up for three days straight, <laughs> and and all of a sudden the the note that they'd written wasn't what the copy is copied, and the drummer's yeah. playing what the copy is copied, and he's trying to say that's not what's written, and and the guy's going. <laughs> It is what's written. No, it's not. You know, and and, and we, you know, uh, it, it was an interesting period, and and we don't have necessarily those periods anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, y yes, there are high pressure situations, and I honestly believe that uh, that the PTSD that comes from the red light syndrome is something to significantly be uh, dealt with. But if if you if you structure your life in such a way that you actually go uh okay pressure is a privilege and i'm prepared for whatever gets thrown at me then then that's great you know and you and, and you can deal with it and you can enjoy it as opposed to have people implode under pressure and you see that a lot you see you know kids that suffer from stage fright that don't have the tools it, all it is is do I have the tools to deal with it? Hmm. That's it. You know, Don Green has great, great information on dealing with uh, stage fright. You know, and he started by it very honestly about, you know, he was a swimmer and how, how, why did he, was he able to do all these things in practice? And then when he got, you know, at the meet, why was he not able to perform as well? And he hmm. went into psychology and learned about that. And, and that's a lot of part of what we have to do if we're going to be performers. And if we're going to just enjoy music for ourselves, which I think is the best, you know, that, that uh, we don't have to worry about that. We just play, we play, we play for our own enjoyment and, and we still connect the right brain and the light, uh, left brain. And, uh, but if, if for those of us who have to go out and make a living with it, we have to, we have to be uh, aware of stuff like pressure. This morning, I woke up and I could tell that from the pounding in my ears just when I woke up that I was anxious about getting on with you guys today. Oh, you don't no, have to be you worried. I, I, was I was excited. And that's that's one of the part of the mental process. Do I mm. do I convert that anxiety, if you will, into uh, excitement or do I let it cause me to be anxious? Uh, and, and, you know, what you have to have, there are tricks. There are just, just like, you know, uh, when, when you're preparing for an audition and, and they make you sit out in a cold hallway for an hour, you know, how do you keep your hands warm? What do you do? The cowling Institute, you know, all those stretching isometric exercises that you can do to keep the blood flowing. There's a thing that we used to call the Grierson which which Ralph every morning he'd come in he'd already played at home and he'd come in and he'd do this you know for about five minutes get the blood flowing in his hands and then there was this and then there was the modified <laughs> Grierson and then you know and 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 you can get the blood flowing in your hands when you haven't played for 15 minutes and that's a big deal you know you get you get to one of these performances and you have to hang out by the side of the stage and you have to discipline yourself to actually be prepared to walk out and play as opposed to, oh, I'm hanging out, I'm being distracted. Oh, look at those people over there. They look like they're having fun. You know, I'm thinking about patch changes. You know, mm -hmm. where, where, where are the foot pedals today? Are they, are they taped down? Are they, <laughs> you know, what, what, what needs to happen for me in my performance? And, and how am I keeping my hands warm? Right. And- uh, What about the flow state? How about the what? The flow state, getting into the flow state. Getting into the flow. Well, that's that's going to help me, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, and and people like Doc Severinsen. When I was growing up uh, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Doc Severinsen would come through, and and I'd see you know uh, Bill Hughes uh, and Bill Palmer as well, and they talk about their performance and and how they got into a mental state, mental state. Uh, uh, but Doc Severinsen, uh, Rich Madison, they had a it turned to us before uh, we we're all hanging out backstage. They're talking, 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 explaining, telling stories. And then they say, you know what, guys, I need 20 minutes before I go on stage just to get my head in the right place. Yep. Huh. And, yeah. and there was there was a pattern that they did every time you see the sports guys doing it. 
you know, Kobe Bryant. He works out for five. He worked out for five hours before he went to warm up for the game. Worked out. You go, aren't you afraid you're going to be tired? You know, for the, no, that's what it takes me to get up to my level before I warm up in front of the people. And, and, uh, and you see the guys with the headphones in where they're not being distracted. They're listening to their playlist or they're listening to their psychology, whatever it is that gets them into that, like you said, the flow state, the zone. And, um, and uh, that's live performance, which is significantly different than I've spent most of the last 48 years doing, which is being in a studio where almost always, unless I'm with a live orchestra, I have the ability to stop make a judgment, make a correction, go, okay, what would happen if I did this there? Let me be as creative as possible. It, well, so, it's, it's two sides of the coin. Right. Per, uh, perfect performance, you know, only comes from perfect practice. Mm -hmm. And in my job, I didn't, we didn't get to practice. We got the music or we played the track, the song, and we improvised to it, period. Mm -hmm. And you played it once, you played it twice, maybe you played it five times. In very rare situations, like a Lionel Richie, I'd spend a day on it, you know, but then I'd never play it again, ever, ever, not ever. Yeah. I'd never play the same piece of music again. And, and uh, when you're doing performance, it's a whole different mindset. Um, and anyway, so uh, you you wanted to know about session work. It's I hope I'm touching on some of it. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I'm. No, the, the the psychology is all is all fascinating. But you know, you, when you when you name drop somebody like Lionel Richie, you know, we have to kind of. I feel like we have to dive into that a little bit. So you know, looking at your studio credits, when you've got Lionel Richie and Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson, and I mean, it, the list goes on and on. How did you, how did you jump into that? How did you get your toes wet? How did you, how did you find your way to that kind of stuff? Okay, uh, I can. I, it's, it, for me, it's pretty simple. Um, the accordion orchestras that I played with, we recorded. The bands at in college, the orchestras. I, I'm sorry, in high school, uh, they they recorded, and you know we had a little eight track studio in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and uh, he would come around and record these events. And uh, then when I had a band. And I started writing songs after yeah, I saw the Beatles and reading the books about the Beatles and, you know, reading all of John Lennon's poetry and all that. I started writing poetry and and uh, writing uh, songs. And, you know, I end up with a band and we're writing uh, original stuff and we make a record and we, you know, have to travel 50 miles outside of Cedar Rapids, 30 miles outside of Cedar Rapids to Iowa City to uh, uh, make this record in what is essentially a converted gymnasium. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, at that time, and I think, I don't know if I would talked about when we were rolling or if it was before, how uh, how to make a break in your music world? I'd been on I'd been <laughs> to California. First off, all the records that I ever bought, all the records I ever bought said recorded in Hollywood. Almost all of them said recorded in Hollywood, California. So I came out and uh, I went uh, on a tour with a, a youth group, and we went through San Francisco, we went through Los Angeles, uh, and. I'd bought records, you know, I'd gone into those days, you go into a record store and there was a person who knew the stock and you could say, get, you know, give me, give me the coolest records. You know, somebody gave, somebody showed me Iggy Pop and then they showed me the Naz with which Todd Rundgren. Hmm. Oh my word. What a, what a life changing moment that was to get a copy of the Naz and listen to the guitar solo on Kitty Boy. And the, and the horn arrangement. And then later I sat on the board with the producer of that record. I sat on the board of Naris, the people who do the Grammys, with the, the producer of that record who gave me all the inside fist fight stories and stuff during that recording. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, so I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the back of that, those records all say recorded in Hollywood. I'd go after hours, they still allowed kids that were 16, 17 years old to go to the Holiday Inn 
when there was a Holiday Inn circuit where they'd have live bands playing. And I'd go watch and studio musicians in off season and stuff would like Lonnie Kazan would have a, have a band behind her. And they'd all be great musicians that were playing on all kinds of records, but then they'd go on the road with her and they do, you know, a six week tour uh, of the Holiday Inns. And I'd, I'd go and I'd hang out and I'd look at them and watch them and talk to them and get the stories. And, and uh, they let me sleep on their sofa when I came out to Los Angeles when I was 16 and 17 and 18. I started, even in high school, I'd take, you know, the winter break and I'd go out to California. Hmm. And, and I'd audition. I'd go to the Guitar Center and in the back that have the, the um, bulletin board and it would say, you know, keyboard player needed, key, uh, uh, B3 player uh, who sings is needed, you know, trumpet player who plays keyboards is needed. And I'd go audition for all these things. <laughs> and, and eventually I ended up playing with, I oh, just, I, 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 I auditioned for Charlie Fox who, if, if the people out there listening don't know, Charlie Fox wrote Happy Days. He, he wrote uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Uh, he wrote Love Boat. He wrote, you know, it was just, uh, and I played on those things with him uh, through meeting him through these auditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I played with um, the lady who wrote, that ain't no way to leave, uh, to, that ain't no way to treat a lady, no way to treat your baby for Helen Reddy. You know, uh, uh, Harriet Shock. I played uh, played for her. Uh, I played on the first recording of uh, "Killing Me Softly" uh, for the lady who had the first recording. You know, on her first. Yeah. And and you know, for, through those auditions, and then I I got to play with White Trash. Edgar Winter had just left White Trash, and I got to rehearse with them for about three days. Then they found out I was 17, and I couldn't play in the nightclubs <laughs> that they were touring in the South. And, 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 you know, I couldn't go on tour with them, so I had to go back to school. I went back to school. I went on the road for a little bit. I came back, and I went to, back to college and studied electronic music. You asked what my first synthesizer was. Mm. Honestly, my first synthesizer was a piece of paper. Jerry, Dr. Jerry Owen at Coe College, neither of us had a synthesizer, and he taught me what everything did on a piece of paper. I studied, oh. and, and not, the, you know, I'm not an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. I don't care what a circuit does unless it makes something sound better. And then let the electrical uh, engineer do it, the triple mm -hmm. E do it, and then I'll, I'll just have the benefit of it. I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy that it sounds better. But uh, he would teach me, you know, signal flow, what all the, the harmonic makeup of the oscillators, what a filter did, what the different types of filters did, you know, mm -hmm. how to shape with an envelope generator, what could you do with control voltages. Uh, and, and we learned that on paper. And eventually, uh, then I went to school where they had a modular Moog and they had an ARP 2600. And after that, I bought an ARP 2600. But I had right. fallen in love initially with an EMS Synthy and from listening to uh, uh, listening to Isao Tamita's music and also Wendy Carlos's music. You know, mm -hmm. I listened to Wendy first and then, you know, at the same period, in the same week of time, I happened upon Isao Tamita, who still, to me, those are the greatest synthesizer records ever made, mm -hmm. you know. I think the Chemical Brothers with their score to Hannah, if you guys haven't listened to that, anybody, it, the, for people who are out there listening, if you're going to go out and rent this movie, it can be pretty brutal. You know, it's about a 16-year-old girl who, uh, you know, is essentially a secret agent uh, type person, and, and there's a lot of fighting, but, but the score is unbelievable. You just go, oh my goodness, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but in it's uh, it's oh to me that I still listen to it today. And I, I went out and I bought the quad. They they now have uh, super uh, uh, the SACDs where you can have five one and quad recordings, uh, uh, special mixes of it's oh to me it's it's phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. And 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 I, I fell in love. I just fell in love. And as much as I fell in love with being a member of a rock band, like when I saw the Beatles, when I heard Isao Tamita and saw what a synthesizer could do, I went, that, this is it. This is us. I love this. I want to spend the rest of my life doing this. This is something I could do 18 hours a day, seven days a week. 
and uh, not regret. And that in itself is a danger because anything that you do 18 hours a day, seven days a week means you're neglecting something else. You know? <laughs> so, and you pay a price along the way, but so. So uh, do, you, do you remember the first time you took a synth into a studio or played a synth in a studio? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the first times were, of course, were recording my own demos, which okay. I brought my demos out to Los Angeles. And, and in those days, there were three or four uh, big buildings right at the corner of Sunset and Vine that had like all of the publishing companies in it, all of the record companies in it, uh, even the major recording studios like RCA, where the Stones were recording and Barbara Streisand was recording and Bones Howe was recording, all these people that I eventually worked with. Uh, I would go uh, up and down. I had one cassette and they'd say, leave your cassette. I'd say, no, I'll just wait until you listen to it. And then I got to take it back because I only have one copy, you know, and, and, uh, and that's part of uh, Michael Boddicker 101. Now, when, when people come to work for me, you know, you put your, your label on it, you put your label on it, you put your name, your contact information and something that won't change like how, if, if in 10 years somebody stumbles across that cassette or that CD or whatever and says, oh, that's great. I actually have use for that. You know, it says John at the top. No, <laughs> you know, it's got to say some, something that lasts on how I can get in touch with you. And uh, anyway, so I, I'd go in a, a, and, and they would, you know, I sold a couple of my songs. But what happened was those people started hiring me to play. And at that time, I had an ARP soloist, which had aftertouch, right? Mm -hmm. That was the big right. deal, guys, yeah. aftertouch. An uh, ARP string ensemble, which, you know, in those days, you could half speed stuff. And the ARP, ARP string ensemble, when you half speed the tape machine and double the, the rate of everything, it sounds phenomenal and silky and beautiful. And uh, an ARP 2600. So I had an ARP 2600. And in those that day, uh, Minimo was, was, uh, really starting to come into popularity. Um, uh, you know, uh, not so much because of Keith Emerson, but, uh, because of people like, uh, Jan Hammer, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, even though it's limited in what you could do as far as it's, it's a monophonic instrument. So if you wanted to play a chord, you had to have three tracks which meant that you had to have a really good idea of what you were going to play because you had to plan it out ahead of time uh, or write it out ahead of time. And that's what, you know, uh, David Page was doing that. The guy who did the solo on um, uh, Lido Shuffle, uh, mm. which, you know, Jeff McCarl's great drum stuff, or, or uh, Mike Post when he did that record for uh, Rockford Files theme. You know, he, there's, there's three three parts on part of that where he wrote it out and played all three tracks differently. And um, uh, so I, I, I started bringing synthesizers into mostly R&B oriented sessions. It, in 1973 and 74, again, uh, it was a catch 22 kind of situation where people would say, oh, I don't hear any of that on a gold record, so I'm not going to use it. Well, how mm -hmm. do I get it on a gold record if you won't let me play it on a gold record? Right. You know, and, and so eventually, uh, one of my songwriting partners, Rob Royer, who was the uh, founder of a band called Bread with David Gates and Jimmy Griffin uh, and Mike Botts, uh, and they... Uh, uh, they uh, brought me in to play synthesizer on uh, a record. And by that time, I had actually gotten an Oberheim 6 voice uh, that I was able to then go in. And uh, we had our, I had my first gold record. I got a gold record on Lost Without Your Love for Bread. And after that, bang, Olivia Newton-John, Quincy Jones, uh, uh, Br Brothers Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Gene Page. Who I'd been again? I said I'd been pay, playing on R&B. Uh, R&B records. You listen to what happens in what is uh, now uh, called urban music. That's where a lot of innovation comes from. 
mm-hmm. you know. And even if if I can't get behind some of the the lyric content and stuff, the innovation in the sounds and stuff and the approaches, that's that that's it's awesome. And and listening to the Isley Brothers and especially at Motown. You know, I worked with all the Jacksons, Jermaine, uh, Tito, uh, Michael. I played on uh, with all the individual members of Earth, Wind and Fire before I played on Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, you know, and go out to dinner at their nightclubs and stuff. And, and you know, it, it uh, eventually it just got to the place where I guess one of the 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 parts was I was playing live with a TV artist. I became his pianist, which I'd never been a pianist before. I ne- I went out, I rented a piano for $25 a month from Hollywood Piano Rental, and, and I, I transcribed, I wrote out all of the piano parts on all of his records. I showed up for the, the rehearsal or the, the audition, and I could play all of his songs perfectly, exactly the way they were on the record. And he went, auditions are over. And all the guys in the band went, no, 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 not this kid. And, 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 and I just, uh, I, I got the job and he had a TV show. And I went and I, um, I, I played on his TV show and I got to know all the guys. And I got to know, you know, most importantly, Mike Post. I think uh, that Mike Post, you know, took me under his wing. He taught me a lot. You know, a lot of stuff that maybe, you know, people don't think about in the music business. I showed up once at Mike's house. He had an 8.30 session. I showed up at 8.02. He said, be at my house at 8 o'clock. And I showed up at 8.02 and I knocked on his front door and his wife answered and said, "Uh, I'm sorry, you missed it. Mike's gone. He said 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Not 8.02. Not 8.03. 8 o'clock. And Mike Post actually drove to the stage with a stopwatch so he could watch how many minutes and seconds it took him to make it to his stage. He had his schedule for three months broken out into two hour periods, including the time he was gonna spend with his family, including the time he was sleeping. It was all broken out. And and I'd never, you know, I'd never witnessed other than my parents opening a store at nine o'clock and closing it at 10 o'clock, but not going, you know, this is what's going to happen every two hours in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he taught me so much, taught taught me. And and, and then at one point when you could buy a a a BMW, not a BMW, an MG uh, for 7,000 bucks, I bought a $7,000 brand new convertible uh, MG and my, Mike Post taught me how to really drive an MG up on Mulholland Drive. <laughs> scary, <laughs> scary, buddy. But, but you know, and, and, and I look at that car, and I had a blau-punked recorder in it, and I recorded ideas all the time. I, I thought about music. If I, took a, if I took a two-day weekend and went to Palm Springs, I bought the top 40 at Tower Records, and I took my headphones, and I uh, got them on disc, and I got them on uh, cassette, and I take my cassette machine and sit by the pool and listen to the top 40 every weekend. All, mm-hmm. that's, that's what I did. And then when I started working with Quincy, and Qu- Quincy would go, well, you know, if you listen to Respiku, you'll hear a lot of John Williams in Respiku. And I'm going, you know, Montavani. I, I l- grew up on Montavani. I did go to the symphony concerts with my parents, but the, uh, uh, you know, I, I had to go and do a deep dive in my early 20s into all this classical music that wasn't ne- necessarily diatonic. You know, some of it was just gorgeously diatonic, but, so, you know, some of it was was just odd, like listening to John Cage and Harry Parch for the first time and going, oh, my goodness, you know, these people are really thinking outside the box, mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, then when I, uh, I, I had experienced those people in college who, you know, if if I brought in if I brought in Keith Emerson playing a classical piece, my professor, who's who's passed on now, so I can say it, he'd say, you bring in stuff like that again to my class, I'll fire you. And, you know, you're, 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 you're out of my class forever. You're, you're flunked. And, 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 uh, when, uh, and they, they dump ping pong balls into the inside of a piano and they'd go brilliant, brilliant, great. And I'd go, now, wait a minute. Now, if I'm going to do that on stage for a million people, nobody's going to buy that, but they would buy Keith Emerson, you know? And, and, and I got into, 
that, okay, how do I reach the most people? And, and I know I've touched on that a little bit already, but I think that's the point. If mm -hmm. they're, they're, for me, in what I'm doing as a professional musician, it's very important that we keep in mind that, that we have the ability to live, to eat, to pay car insurance, to make uh, house payments, to put kids in decent schools and to clothe them and feed them as well. <laughs> you know, we, we, we got to make a buck. And, and uh, uh, in my, my approach, popular music has been the best way of doing that. Popular music and then film music, film and TV. But uh, I did, I did take, uh, make forays into advertising and stuff. And it was great for a period. It was really great for a period. But, you know, you've watched Ad Men and it's all true. You know, it's like, hmm. those shows are, are very <laughs> realistic. Uh, uh, it's just how much you, of that do you want in your life? Uh, I, I love 30 second formats, 60 second formats, three minute formats, seven minute formats. You know, I love film. I love TV. I love all the uh, different ways that I can make, write, make, play on, help people create this last week. I've done three different films, three different films and one TV show, as well as I've written three songs in the last week. And, uh, and my jobs are very different on all of them. Some of them, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at the computer and gauging the performance and recording, tweaking, making sure it's labeled correctly so it fits in with everybody else's stuff. You know, almost all the choirs are virtual now. The orchestras are even virtual. And, um, all of it comes into play all of my musical experience my musical training and and i i don't have the greatest gift in the world for anybody who's listening who goes oh i couldn't possibly do that because i i don't know you know this or i wasn't born with that or i didn't you know my my musical gift is not my wife's my wife has perfect pitch i have recordings of my wife when she was uh, four years old playing, uh, saying, I will now play Chopin's etude and whatever, you know, and, and at four years old, at eight years old, she was studying at the graduate level at USC. Perfect pitch. She hears and she goes in bar 18, you know, there's uh, the violins are playing a C and uh, you have C sharp written on the vocals. And she does that without listening to the track. And, and uh, you know, and, and my gift is not that. My gift is not that. I was not born with perfect pitch. And I think we talked about that a little bit, but I was raised playing diatonic music mostly. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it gets, for me, it gets a little tricky. You have guys who have ears that are this big and can hear everything. I, I talked to a guy uh, uh, who works with Casio, who told me that he was running and he, when he runs, he listens to Stravinsky and he can see the score in front of his eye, his mind's eye as he's running. And by just by listening, you know, and uh, Lyle Mays was like that. When he was 14 years old, Lyle Mays could listen to a bar of music, a big band music. He'd listen to a bar, he'd lift the needle and he'd write down all the instruments for that entire bar. And then he'd play another bar and write it down. And I know this because I went to jazz camp with him and I watched him do it. And, and you know, that's not my gift, but my gift is what it is. And I have to use my gift the best I can. That's my job is to take my five talents not my 15 talents, but my five talents and use them the best I can to do what God would have me accomplish with them. And I don't mean to go all spiritual on you, but you know, that's the bottom line. I have to, I have to use whatever I can with my gifts to do the best job I can. And, and that means not being oppressed by somebody who's better than me. There's always going to be somebody better. I was going to say, in my experience, there's always, you know, no matter how yeah. good you are, you'll always see somebody better. But, you know, it, it sounds, you know, and I'm really, really inspired by your story because you develop a knowledge of your instrument. You develop, you know, you work on that. You know your instrument. You know the music. There's there's a certain amount of work that you have to do, and then there's a certain amount of um, just being genuine with the people you're around, the people you meet, and, you know, leaving impressions and and establishing with them that you know you've done the work and you're you know, making those relationships based upon the work that you've put in 
That's that's a lot of it, and and uh, you know there are some key things which a lot of people don't talk about in the music business. Uh, we talked about the athleticism, the business. You know, it's music. Music is this big, and business is this big. You know, you got it's uh, you have to if you don't have your business together, ain't gonna matter. You know, in my business, if I showed up, if I blew one session, one session, one 15 minutes, gone, goodbye, thanks. I watched it to happen to so many people, particularly drummers. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, if, if you have a chance, look this up, how to make a break in the music world. It's still Dick Clark, you know, I wrote down, there was a period of about 10 years when I wrote down, when I met somebody, I wrote down in a book, in, in, in a, a legal tab, uh, everybody I met, all the connections I made, everybody, you know, I still have all my early Rolodexes. If you, some of you young people don't know what a Rolodex is, it used to be where you put business cards in a circular file and, and I still have all my phone books, you know, I can track uh, generally track people down it's it's important to be able to follow through with stuff if you tell somebody you're going to do something how are you going to get in touch with them you mm -hmm. know oh oh i would have shown up but i didn't know where to go no you, you got to be able to track them down so you know the uh, this pamphlet uh, organizations like nam organizations like the society of composers and lyricists uh, where you can go in and you can watch people that are actually out there doing exactly what you want to do every day. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll give you tips. And, and most of the time, in my experience, uh, most of these people are happy to share and give. Very few do I meet that uh, are like, oh, no, that's, that's my trade secret. Mm -hmm. I don't talk. I don't share that with somebody. I'm sorry. No, you know, <laughs> Albert Einstein didn't keep his secrets. It made, maybe when we were talking about the atomic, you know, developing the atomic bomb, there was a time where there were secrets in there, but he was definitely working with his team and sharing the information with them. But, yeah. you know, uh, you, uh, we share, we grow, you, you find somebody who plays better than you. What is it that I can look at and apply to my life? You know, yeah. what can what can I learn? How can I learn to practice? I shared with you guys the other day about Larry Mahobarak mm -hmm. and about like a lot of people don't know, like, ha, OK, I'm, I'm going to come into a session. I'm going to play a piece of music, you know, Im immediately that I've never seen before. How do you do it? Well, first thing you do is you sit down, put your, in my instrument, put my hands on the keyboard. Don't press down the keys. Read the music through slowly imagining myself playing it as slowly as necessary to play it perfectly. And then everything after that point, once it's entered into the brain perfectly, everything after that point is mechanics. You know, you just, yeah. you speed, you speed it up. Mm -hmm. And, and, and as long, as long as you, you know, put the correct information in the first time, you don't have to correct it, you know. Right. You, it, it's uh, you don't have to uh, overcome mistakes, uh, and, and that that's Larry Mahobrek, and that's you know I will never in my life be able to play as well as Larry Mahobrek played. Larry Mahobrek can play stride piano, uh, and 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 with every note written out, boom, ding, 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 fast, 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 fast. And, and uh, be able to, while he was doing it, uh, uh, you know, look over and go, there's a mistake coming up in bar 55. I don't think that's what they intended, you know? And, and, and then they'd say, you know, it's too high for the singer. Can we just do it down a half step? And he'd go, yeah, sure, no problem. And then he'd play it half step down, you know? Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, what, what do I take, I, I had the opportunity to sit over Michael O'Marty and David Page, David Foster, uh, um, Larry Mahobrak, um, Sonny Burke, uh, Mike Lang, uh, Ralph Grierson, all of these phenomenal, uh, phenomenal musicians. I know I, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of people, but, you know, Greg Gaines. you just go, you know, there's a gift there that they've been given. But when certain people 
transfer from a piano to an organ? Do they play it the way an organ needs to be played? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the things that I can do because that's in my blood. I learned to play an organ as an organ, not as an extension of a piano. Uh, I, I learned to play an accordion as an accordion, not as an extension of a piano. I, uh, I learned to play a synthesizer as a synthesizer. It is not a piano instrument. You know, right. the fact that, that it's been popularized with a keyboard is way against what the, the beginnings of this instrument were, you mm -hmm. know, uh, or that it was po uh, it's popularized using a sequencer that's that's not what it was originally uh developed to to do it, it's it's essentially a big noise maker and you can control it anyway uh uh bj you've got a drum uh controller in the back you've got a keyboard to the right there are guitar controllers wind controllers there are uh pitch to, to voltage converters all those things you use whatever you can, and the synthesizer part is completely separate from the input mechanism. Mm, yeah. Although yeah. the gonna... input mechanism lets me play, you know, and add vibrato or pitch bend or, you know, shape. Uh, you know. So any anyway. So I, I Michael, I've, I've got a question kind of along those lines a little bit, but first I want to check in to see if we have any viewer questions. We do. Uh, I was actually going to segue you. since we were sharing. We we're talking about sharing. I was going to share some of the uh, questions that have I've, I've actually let I haven't let them pile up, but I'm noticing that they're getting they're they're uh, percolating up in the uh, chat here. So our very own uh, Joe Rogers, who's here every week and he's a, a volunteer at the museum, uh, asks any Don Buchla synths that you've used. I'm rebuilding my Don Buchla synth that I didn't even know I had. <laughs> but over the over the years, you know, uh, we we have four different businesses. Synthesizer four different problems. Se se yeah, <laughs> four different separate corporations, and uh, you know, and most of them uh, have have developed as an offshoot of being a content creator. So I'm a content creator. I make music. I play music. Uh, I create music and then I have instruments. And so pretty soon I have a thousand instruments and what do I do with them to let them pay for their storage? And, and I have a recording studio and what do I do with it to let it pay for itself? And uh, uh, one of the things I ended up with a Buchla, uh, I don't know how, in my <laughs> attic, wrapped in a box and I'm rebuilding it now and it's great, you know? But Don Buchla, honestly, I'll tell you Don, my Don Buchla story, I, I, I went to uh, Don, I went to uh, Alan Strange's, uh, I, I went up to meet with him, Alan Strange, who was a professor of music and a synth player and, a, and an author. And I went up uh, to San Francisco area, San Jose area, and uh, I went to Don Buchla's house he had a little house and he was had uh, synthesizers in the garage and we went out back and we played uh, played this stuff and I called him about a week later he said oh tell me what do you do again I said well this week I did the sounds of bionic dog I have a, a record out that's a Michael Jackson record that's on the radio and whatever he said you're doing TV show and, and I, I don't want anybody using my instruments like that and he uh, hung up the phone on me <laughs> wow and, and that oh, no. but that was done you know at that day Don was very much kind of a purist he was mm -hmm. Going, you know, if it's not silver apples of the moon and, and Morton Sabotnik, then I don't want my instruments being used on popular music like my professor in college. You know, uh, it, it just he he was he was after serious music. Hmm. And uh, but but so I'll tell you in a year next year when we talk, I'll tell you about my bookla because I haven't I have never played it yet. Wow. Getting it up to speed. All right. And so <laughs> I love that story. Uh, let's see. Oh, Mr. Bill is watching, too. Uh, let's see. Hi, Michael. He says, I guess I, he says, I've got I got a guess. You worked with Tommy Tedesco in the studio at some point. Uh, any Tommy Tedesco stories? Oh, huge. Huge. <laughs> Tommy Tedesco was incredible. He, what an incredible musician. One of the greatest things he said was, I, the best job I ever had was being a night watchman in a warehouse. He said, I hated that job. It was the best job I ever had because mm -hmm. what I did as a night watchman is I practiced the guitar all night. I, I hated that job so much. I practiced really hard. And, and so it was the best job I ever had. And, and, uh, and, and he could play anything. He, he had, um, nerves of steel 
he 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 just he was just he could play anything it didn't matter you know we'd been working all day it was two minutes before midnight we're about to go into golden overtime with with a hundred piece orchestra and tommy's got a solo to play didn't make any difference to him he just you know he just he just gave it, it just came poured out of him the music he was a phenomenal musician and and he gave he gave it all he he gave every single session he gave it all and he also i could go into some of the humorous parts but but he uh tommy did you ever see, did you guys know about the gong show mm-hmm yeah, yeah. yeah I, I I didn't watch it, but you know I I know what it is. I'm... Tommy Tedesco won the Gong Show. Oh, right on. He, yeah. he, Tommy Tedesco was about five foot four, and he weighed three hundred pounds, and he got in a pink tutu, and he played <laughs> classical guitar, like serious classical guitar on the Gong Show. Won the Gong Show. Wow. He was he, he, he was, <laughs> you know he did he, he didn't care. He, he just, he, what a great guy. What a great mm-hmm. attitude. And he used to do things like me, say, Mike, you've been doing this for what, five years now? I say, yeah, five years. He says, wait until you've been doing it for 15. Let's see how interested you can keep yourself in it for 15. To inspire me to pay attention to that. Not go, oh, I, you know, yeah, this is tiring. This is old. But, you know, how do you keep yourself renewed? How do you keep, you know, learning and growing and reaching out? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Great that story. Great. Dude, great. Great. Uh, great. I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with these questions. Let's see. Uh, another one from Joe Rogers, and I know the answer to this one. Have you ever worked with Hans Zimmer? Uh, in fact, recently, uh, recently, I can't tell you what, uh, but uh, oh, Hans Zimmer. Uh, you know, we we did projects where back in the day, uh, I had uh, a company that did uh, sound design back before sound design was popular. Hmm. And always trouble being on the bleeding edge, you know, oh, wait a minute, it's not just Foley, it's not just hand, hand uh, sounds, it's not just whatever, it's not the, uh, 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 when, when on Buckaroo Bonsai, I did this where where we made the sounds of the electroids and we made the sounds of, of the, the pods and the, the sounds of the, uh, the spaceships and all that stuff. And, and, and first off they go, oh, there's no category for that because it's not Foley, it's like super Foley. Uh, and it, it's, it became synthesized sound design. So back then we did a, a, a black something or other. It was a, a it was a movie about uh, J- Japan, uh, and they had uh, they had anyway they had a bunch of trucks, and we had super sound design, and Hans did the score, and and so as early as that, I started working with him, and I'd see Hans from time to time, uh, where he's doing the music, and I, I my company was just doing the the sound effects, and um, he is an innovator of innovators. He really, you know, you you listen to the stuff that he did uh, as a synth player and then as a uh, composer, and the fact that he changed this industry, you know, he he got it to the place where you know synthesizers changed what was available. When I used to do it, I used to, you know, if I used a sequencer and you couldn't really edit in the middle of a sequence on an MSQ 700. Yeah, uh, when we eventually got to uh, computer sequencers, uh, you could edit in the middle. But but you know there would be there'd be damage that was done on the in and the out. You'd have to go through and correct all the tracks. You know, whereas the French horn player would just go, oh, you want it louder at that track or at that place? And he would just play louder. And I'd be like scrambling because, you know, when I was doing things like Free Willy, I was not only playing four sounds live on a single cue, but I had 10 sequencer tracks running (laughs) at the the same time. (laughs) And I'd have to pre-program all the synthesis. Well, you know, Hans Zimmer, uh, God bless him, he got to the place where, you know, that was all you'd have all this stuff set up and running live not where where you'd have to oh okay let me set that sound up 
No, those sounds are all set up and run in line live, like kind of like Chris Lord Algae mix, where the reason Chris Lord Algae can mix all of the, the records on the voice is because he's got five snare drum sounds already set up to go. Hmm. Five kick drum sounds already set up to go. They're all set in stone. You can you you don't have to manipulate anything. You just push up the fader and it's there. And and Hans Zimmer changed the industry because he could move so quickly. It was phenomenal. And and today even even now, but he's so prolific and his work ethic is second to none. Uh, you know, uh, second to I don't know anybody who works harder than Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer has uh, um, I'll just say this seven days a week. Christmas, like like Mike Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson used to be, you know, but but Michael Jackson got to where he was playing around a little bit. Hans Zimmer just shows up and works from 11 o'clock in the morning till three or four o'clock in the morning, seven days a week, 365 days a year and 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 loves every minute of it. You can tell from his music. He just pours his heart into all of it. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. He's a phenomenal guy. Fantastic. All right, a couple more. Uh, these are from Jeanette. Uh, she actually, you're, you're kind of related, so I'm just going to to zoom through them here. Uh, how did you get involved with TV and film, like writing for TV and film or playing for TV and film? Was it was it by being around people in LA? And then, do you have any advice for those who would be interested, who want to get their music in TV and film in this day and age? Any any words of wisdom there? Oh, absolutely. That that part has exploded. You know, and and uh, watching it change over the years, uh, there's so many more opportunities. Used to be that there were five A-list composers. Now there's you know, hundreds. You know, uh, who of people who can actually turn in a really good score. It sounds great. That does everything that the audience needs and everything the director needs. You know, uh, one of the hardest parts for me uh in 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 learning about this was how ha- how to you know it's not all about is that listenable is it ear candy like on pop records the whole thing was what what will what will excite the ear what will make people want to listen to the record again uh in in film and tv music it you got to hit the emotion you're you're the emotion uh, uh the subtext of of the the story and uh how, how do you do that 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 took a little learning for me but the uh i i did i i talked about mike post already and pete carpenter who was just sweet sweet man and and a bunch of other people not not to you know you you, you meet a lot of people like barry divorzon is a tremendous success story and barry divorzon plays piano like this you know, it, it, it's it, and and when I worked with Michael uh, Masser, uh, who wrote The Greatest Love of All, Michael Masser played piano like that. He was not a great piano player, but he could do it over and over again until he got it perfected and worked out all the things, which is kind of what people do now with computers, where they play it and massage it and play it and massage it and play it and massage it. But if you want to get into TV and film work, the opportunities are huge with Netflix. The bottom line is, here's what you have to to pay attention to. There are all kinds of... uh, ways of thinking out there i'll put it nicely that that say oh give us the music and we'll own it and that's not the way you become successful you know there used to be those ads in the back of music magazines give me a thousand dollars and i'll make your record for you you know the bottom line is somebody's going to make a record for you that's any good they're they're going to invest their own money in you not have you invest your money in it you know, Quincy Jones was very clear about that. Why would I, what would, with, with all the success he'd had, why would I, if I couldn't get a Mo Austin or a Herb Alpert to be interested in, in an artist enough to pay for making the record, why would I put my own money into it? You know, I need to be able to market it and that's how I'm gonna market it is if somebody else has a machine to market it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're gonna go to Netflix, you know, this baloney about, you know, giving up uh, your rights. Don't ever listen to anybody. Run as fast as you can from those situations. You you make your money in the long term, you end up to have a long 
happy life in the music industry when you own the product that you make. Doesn't mean that you can't give people a license to use it. Doesn't mean that you can't share the publishing with them, you know, so that they have an interest in making sure that you you make money as well. They make money, you make money. That's a good thing. A, a win-win is always good. But, um, you know, the idea of somebody saying, oh, no, 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 this is a work for hire and, and I own it. I'll do what I want with it. I can use it again and you never get repaid or you don't get any publishing or you don't get any neighboring rights. You don't get any, you know, don't, don't go there. You want to listen. You want to get involved with people. There are uh, societies like the Society of Composers and Lyricists that have lots of information for you on how to get started. You know, any of, if you look at what NAM is doing now, in the last few years, they've exploded on the creative aspect of, of what it takes uh, to be in the music industry. And, and uh, any of the seminars that they do at the Winter NAM Show and the Summer NAM Show, it's incredible. I think that, that, you know, as soon as we can get back to normal and we can increase that uh, time where instead of starting NAM show on Thursday, we'll start it on Wednesday and the <laughs> seminars will start on Wednesday because you, you got to be able, we, we've got more information out there than we have time in the day. Uh, it's there. It's there. It can be had. All right. I'm going to put me you up. In, send me gonna, your music. Right? Call me I'm up. Gonna, send me your music. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to put you in touch with the NAMS uh, trade show department now. You're going to be in trouble for saying all that. So <laughs> <laughs> starting on Wednesday. Come on now. All oh, right. Well, that, uh, that is uh, all the questions I've, I've gone through on our chat. Uh, a couple notables. Let's see. David Johnson. He saw your digital arts and music conference in Vancouver. Uh, in what? 1985, where you were a host, so he <sighs> has come to see you for that. Good, good, thank you for joining us, David. Uh, we have some more Hi, Canadians, too, from oh, Ottawa. Can I apologize to you for that, David, right now? <laughs> that was I had no idea. I showed up. I, nobody told me anything. I showed up. There were thousands of people there. I had no notes. I had no nothing to project on a screen. I had no idea. I was just asked to be like a keynote speaker, and 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 you know, now I do a NAM show and I show up and I have powerpoints and I have you know giveaways and I have everything else. 1985, it was just like uh, I need to get back for a session in a couple of hours. So like I got an hour break. Let's do it. Let's do a talk to 2,000 people. You know. <laughs> And uh, 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 but but uh, th that was an honor. I just I had no idea. Or do those still go? Does this gentleman have the the? Do those still happen? That I don't know, and we probably won't get a reply for another since the stream is delayed a little bit by probably about 20, 30 seconds. We will find out in a little bit. But Jeanette says she will send you her music, so that that'll be on its way. She's okay. she's another one of our really amazing volunteers at the museum. So she's she's a good a good pianist and singer and. Uh, that's, I'm glad that she's watching. So, uh, if yeah, if uh, if David is still watching, uh, and he's your, if you know if they're still doing those conferences in Vancouver, uh, let us know in the chat. All right. Other than that, yeah, I've I've run out of the uh, the questions. So if I'm going to turn it back over to Jonathan because I know he's guiding our discussion today. Jonathan, Jonathan, thanks for letting me blather on. Uh, <laughs> I, it's always know. it's always a pleasure. Uh, well, the story well, the stories that you've that you've developed you know, over your career, just, it's a, it's an honor to have you to, to share some of them with you. So, um, yeah. And I can only I, imagine we're just touching the tip of the iceberg on yeah. all the, all the Michael Lehman Boddicker stories that exist. So it was a, it was a, a very good era that we're part of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the development of synthesizers, the, through the polyphony of synthesizers through memory, didn't used to have memory in them. And now we have memory. So, you, you know, used to be that I set every sound up from scratch every day on every cue. Uh, and uh, then uh, now now you can, you know, libraries are a big deal. And, and that's a whole different way of thinking. How do you organize your libraries? Mm -hmm. How do you keep them at your fingertips in a manner that you can go, oh, I know. Yeah, I've got... 100,000 sounds. That's not un, un, unreasonable to think. It's probably millions of sounds available. How do I know them all? How do I get 
to be able to where I can access them for the right moment. You know, uh, it's it's uh, it's been interesting to watch it grow and and to watch it grow from where synthesizers were just not reliable. You know, my my polymog, I had four of them because they used to literally catch on fire uh, after the cartridge companies would drop them. And and now you know, Moog synthesizers uh, you know are are bulletproof like Yamaha. You know, you know, go take something on the road. You take a, a Roland, a Yamaha, a Korg, a Casio, a Moog. You know, it doesn't matter that they get jostled a little bit. They work and uh, didn't used to be that way. Um, and I, I just want to interject, you know, because I feel like it's my duty to mention that at the museum, we've got this exhibition about synthesizers. Um, those are running. Cool. It's a thirty five dollar Raspberry Pi computer with open source software running the synthesizer engine. And there's a MIDI connection, plug in your own MIDI device, boom, there's your synthesizer. Um, you know, and that can run reliably. You know, the, the progress, the, the, where we are right now with software synthesizers especially, but also the resurgence and the analog stuff coming out, especially out of the modular community, to you know, the very early vacuum tube driven, massive, monstrous, unreliable, expensive. You know, the change has just been amazing. Yeah, oh yeah. Um... I, 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 I'm, I'm sensitive to when we're going to cut off, so I don't want to keep going, going on. I definitely want to respect our viewers' time, and, and I, I really appreciate everything. Um, but I love how the common thread through all of, you know, I keep trying to get you to talk about gear, and the common thread is always just the love of music and the joy that comes out of it and your human connections uh, with the musicians around you. And I think that's so wonderful because a lot of people hear synth and it's a, it's a machine, it's a robot, it's technology, it's cold and hard and calculating. And, and here you're just, you're, you're sharing music with people and that it's just so wonderful and inspiring. So I just want to say thank you for infusing your career with that love of people. Well, that, that, uh, that's the bottom line for me with synthesizers is generally you know, before you got into Jack Hotop and Eric Pershing designing everybody's sounds for them, uh, you, uh, it, it could be a pretty ugly instrument, mm -hmm. you know, and it was my job to make it sound pretty and it was my job to make it speak, you know, there, there are people still who don't get, you know, engineers, if you will, uh, God bless them. We, we absolutely need them, but, uh, that, that, you know, don't understand why a pitch wheel and a mod wheel are where they are and why you need to have controls where you can think and change just like a violin player, you know, slides when he when he thinks he's going to say he just thinks and slides. He just does it. You know, to me, I can't stop and go, oh, tap, 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 uh, up, 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 enter. OK, adjust the amount. Oh, that's not quite the amount. Let's do this and then say, OK, now I'm going to slide. No, I should be able to just slide, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and how do I infuse that stuff? I've had a couple of little things along the way. I was looking at, I, I, I just was in closing out this warehouse. I had a, uh, two Jupiter 8s and Jim Cooper, back when he uh, first left being an engineer for Tom Oberheim, uh, he, he did these mods on synthesizers. And I actually, in that day, there was no real amount of pitch bend up or down or different, right? So I had him put a pot on the amount up and a pot on the amount down. And so that I could pitch bend up a whole step or a minor third or a half step, whatever, depending on the music, and down a fourth if I wanted. Wow. Or if I needed to change it to where I could do an octave jump, you know, and 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 that was, uh, uh, you know, talk about l little things that make all the difference for playing. And now that's standard. Every synthesizer comes with with that kind of uh, ability to change how much the pitch bend goes up and down, whether or not that pitch bend unit can also open or close the filter. Big deals, big deals 40 years ago, big deals. You know, but um, uh, I, I, my, my job is to make them sound good and, and to make them be human. It's not, you know, yes, yes, they can be electronic and robotic at times. And there's that place. But, you know, it's how, how, to, how, to, how to make it hit a place in your heart. 
and how to make you hopefully want to watch the film again or, or mm -hmm. listen to that record again. Well, I think you've, you've accomplished that many times over. So um, I want to say thank you, you know, personally for me, thank you for participating in this. It's been a, such a pleasure to talk to you uh, on behalf of the museum. Thank you. Um, and, you know, Take it away. I mean, BJ, I, I don't know if you have any parting thoughts here, but. Well, I want, I want to say something. If you guys haven't been down to the museum, you got to go. It's right next to it's right next to the Lego Museum as well. So it's a nice family trip and uh, and it's in a beautiful area of California. And uh, you can you can build a, a, a computerized uh a robotic something at Lego, and then you can come over and you can look at all the music uh, uh, history and stuff at the Museum of Making Music. It's it's really worth the venture. Thank you, Michael. That's very nice of you to say. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this has by far been one of my favorite episodes of, of Mama Home. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, it's... I mean, we could go on for hours, but I, I, yeah, we have to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, these are the these are the moments that I enjoy. This is when you're when you when you find yourself having to 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 not do something that you love and being around the stories and the and the people uh, making music together, as Michael music mentioned earlier. Uh, you realize how important that is, and I'm glad we're able to share some of those stories here and hopefully inspire uh, when we're all back to making music together and seeing you at the museum. Um, we'll. we'll connect again and uh i'm glad we're able to connect now uh michael thank you again uh take That's care funny. everyone and we will see you actually hopefully for friday's mom at home we have uh, a special uh friend and artist and musician of ours talking about the pedal steel guitar rick schmidt who is a pedal steel guitarist he was here in San Diego. musician and, and Michael knows him as well. He's he, we, he was on those Mike many, Post many sessions. We played many sessions together. Yep, I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't realize he was part of the Mike Post sessions. I know he had work in the studio and was really prolific in, in the studio. But I just knew him from a a musician playing in the band, and I had no idea that he also had this. You know, I mean, he's a talented guitarist, and so we're going to be exploring pedal steel guitar on Friday. Next week, we have on Wednesday, I believe it's Bob Taylor talking about a history of Taylor guitars locally here in uh, San Diego. Started here in the late 1970s. Uh, my own family, my dad was uh, an early purchaser of a Taylor guitar, and he has lots of stories. But we're going to have Bob Taylor here to talk about his history of the Taylor guitars. And then on Friday, we have another wonderful artist. So if you want to check the full lineup of Mom at Homes, uh, we actually, it's Deborah henson Conant, another friend of the museum. She plays electric harp and has pushed the boundaries uh, of electric harp. So this Friday, pedal steel guitar with Rick, Rick Schmidt. Next Wednesday, Bob Taylor and Taylor Guitars History. And then next Friday, Deborah henson Conant with the electric harp. So we hope to see you back here uh, for more episodes of Mom at Home. Um, when are we doing Jonathan Piper and the two and uh, the jug our very first episode our michael, very where, first episode where were you michael for our very first episode where we talked oh. all about the jug oh, so. i'll go back uh, oh, i'm telling you <laughs> I, I i had such fun listening to your music jonathan oh, thank it's, you. it's phenomenal phenomenal it's so much you know that that's that's just happy there's no way you can't just enjoy yourself when you're listening yep. to that people yep. walking by my office would go Wow, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. My pleasure. The, the first episode's a little rough. We learned a lot since then, but you can always go back to uh, watch past episodes. All of our guests are, are there, archived on our website, museumofmakingmusic.org. Until then, everyone, thank you. Take care, and we'll see you next time.